Prometheus. Heaven and earth had been created. The sea ebbed and flowed between its shores, and fish frolicked in the waters. In the air sang winged birds, and the earth swarmed with animals. But as yet there was no creature in whose body the spirit could house and from there govern the world around it. Then down to earth came Prometheus, forethought, a descendant of the ancient race of gods which Zeus had dethroned. Now Prometheus was crafty and nimble-witted. He knew that the seed of heaven lay sleeping in the earth, so he scooped up some clay, moistened it with water from a river, kneaded it this way and that, and shaped it to the image of the gods. To give life to his earth-formed figure, he took both good and evil from the core of many animals and locked them in man's breast. He had a friend among the immortals, Athene, the goddess of wisdom, who marvelled at what this son of the Titans had created, and she breathed the spirit, the divine breath, into his creature, which, as yet, was only half alive. In this way, the first men were made, and soon they filled the far reaches of the earth. But for a long time, they did not know what to do with their noble limbs or the divine spirit which had been breathed into them. They saw, yet they did not see. They heard, yet they did not hear. Aimlessly they moved about like figures in a dream and were ignorant of how to profit from creation. They did not know the art of quarrying and cutting stone, of burning bricks from clay, of carving out beams from the trees they hewed in the forest, or of building houses with all these materials. Like scurrying ants, they thronged in sunless caves beneath the surface of the earth. They did not discern the sure signs of winter, of spring decked with flowers, of summer rich in fruits. There was no plan in anything they did. Then Prometheus came to their aid. He taught them to watch the rising and setting of the stars, discovered to them the art of counting and of communicating by means of written symbols. He showed them how to yoke animals and make them share in man's labour. He broke horses to the rain and wagon and invented ships and sails for journeying over the sea. And he concerned himself with all the other affairs of human life also. Formerly, a man who fell ill knew nothing of herbs, of what to eat or not to eat, what to drink or not to drink, nor did he have any salves to ease his pain. For lack of physic, men had perished wretchedly. But now, Prometheus showed them how to compound mild remedies that would dispel every kind of disease. Then he taught them to foretell the future and interpreted dreams and signs for them. The flight of birds and the omens of offerings, he guided them to explore underground so that they might find ore, iron, silver and gold. In short, he introduced them to all the arts and comforts of living. Now, the gods in heaven, and among them Zeus, who had but lately deposed his father Cronus and established his own supremacy, began to notice this new creation, man. They were willing enough to protect him, but in return demanded that he pay them homage. In Meconi in Greece, mortals and immortals met on a set day to determine the rights and duties of man. At this assembly... Prometheus appeared as man's counsel to see to it that the gods, in their capacity of protectors, did not impose too burdensome levies upon men. Zeus denied mortals the last thing they needed to perfect their civilization, fire. But the shrewd Prometheus improvised a way to provide even this lack. He broke a stalk of pithy fennel, approached the chariot of the sun as it spun through the heavens, and held the stalk to its blaze until it smouldered. With this tinder he descended to earth, 
and soon the first pile of brushwood was flaming to the sky. Pain pierced the soul of Zeus the Thunderer when he saw fire rising among men and casting its radiance far and wide. Zeus then turned to the matter of taking revenge on Prometheus. He handed the culprit over to Hephaestus, the fire god, and his servants Kratos and Bia, force and violence. These he bade drag him to the wastes of Scythia, and there, above a sinister chasm, forge him to a steep cliff of the Caucasus with stout, unyielding chains. Hephaestus carried out his father's commands unwillingly, for he loved the son of the Titans because he was his kin. He was compelled to have the cruel order executed, but he spoke words of compassion at which his more brutal henchmen frowned. So Prometheus was forced to hang from the cliff, upright and sleepless, and never could he bend his tired knees. You will utter many plaints and sighs, and they will all be in vain, said Hephaestus, for the purpose of Zeus is unshakable. Hard of heart are those who have but lately wrested power from others and taken it to themselves. The torments of the captive were intended to endure forever, or for thirty thousand years at the very least. He moaned aloud and called on the winds and the rivers, on the zodiac from which nothing is hidden, and on earth, the mother of all, to witness his agony, but his spirit remained steadfast. Zeus was true to his word. Every day he sent an eagle to feed on his captive's liver, which, however much it was devoured, always grew back again. This torture was to last until one came who, of his own free will, would consent to suffer in Prometheus's stead. This came about earlier than the son of the Titans might have supposed. When he had been hanging from his cliff for many a bitter year, along came Heracles, bound on his quest for the golden apples of the Hesperides. He saw the descendant of the gods shackled to the Caucasus and was about to ask him for advice on how to prosper in his search when he was overwhelmed with pity at his fate, for he observed the eagle perched on the knees of the luckless Prometheus. Heracles laid his club and his lion's skin on the ground behind him, launched the arrow and shot the cruel bird from the liver of its anguished host. Then he loosed the chains, delivered Prometheus and led him away. But to satisfy the conditions stipulated by Zeus, he brought Chiron, the centaur, as a substitute. For even though Chiron had claimed to immortality, he offered to die in the Titan's stead. And to fulfil the judgment of Zeus, son of Cronus, in every point, Prometheus, who had been sentenced to the cliff for a far longer time, had always to wear an iron ring, set with a chip from the stony wall of the Caucasus, so that Zeus could boast that his enemy was still forged to the mountain. Mm -hmm.